I'm just going to go through this pretty quick. I just got a couple of pictures of some of the equipment that we use uh, at Poplar Grove to do some of our weed control. Um, the two things that I really want to show you are the cultivator and the herald, I guess. Um, oh, you missed a picture there. Yeah, I know. I'm, oh, okay. It's a longer presentation. I'm just going to shorten it a little here. Um, so uh, this is a picture of our 12-row uh, inter-row cultivator. Um, and this is obviously used for row crop. We're on 22 inch rows. Uh, we use this in our hemp primarily, and uh, also if we grow any corn or beans, uh, we're using it here. Um, so typically on the farm, we like to do at least two cultivations. Uh, one is just post-emergence, so this stuff's about two or three inches tall. And uh, the idea is to be as aggressive as possible without actually covering up any of the plants, so covering up as many of the weeds as we can uh, using the cultivator. Um, this is a picture from the side, just uh, you can see the rolling shields are down and this is a, it's a single shank unit so there's one sweep in the middle about 14 inches wide. Um, so that's the first pass. The second pass, uh, we like to think of it as a hilling pass basically. Um, so you're, you're trying to be as aggressive as you can, you drive faster, move more dirt and basically trying to hill up the, the base of those, of those rows if you can. Um, and it looks something like this. Usually we do it a little bit later, but uh, but you can see we're just we're covering up the the, the soil underneath the plants, basically. Um, and this is what we hope it looks like by the time we're done. Um, and we we've, we've had some pretty good success. There's always a few weeds that get away. You can never get them all, but sometimes you get lucky like this, and uh, it looks pretty good. <coughs> Uh, the other tool we use, and this is in our solid seeded stuff, so any of our grains, is an Einbach Harrow. Uh, we've got a 40 foot model. Um, what's special about the Einbach is it's spring loaded, as you can see, and it's got hooks on the end, so as you drive through the, through the uh, or pull it through the ground, it vibrates a little bit and tends to pull out some of the, uh, some of the weeds that are there. Um, so we do this, usually we like to do a pre-emergence pass, so about five days after planting. Um, we'll go through and do a pre-emergence and the idea here is that you know after you planted the weeds and the crop you know starting day zero are both starting to grow and if you can go through and harrow out some of those weeds five days later you're giving that that crop a chance to get ahead of those weeds by hopefully by five days or so is the idea sometimes um, that's all it takes yeah so and normally we can't see any weeds out there it's just you know they're coming though that's the, that's the thing. Um, yeah, so the harrow tends to work best for deep-seeded crops and, and uh, shallow-rooted weeds. So if you're thinking you're going to pull out any can of the thistle of this thing, <laughs> no way, man, it's not going to happen. Uh, so it works well for your grains, your beans, anything that's more than an inch deep. Um, Post-emergence pass, this is always the trickiest one because it, you can do a lot of damage. Um, but uh, basically the smaller the weeds are, the easier they are to kill. Uh, so you want to try and get them at that white thread stage and basically to see them at the white thread stage if you you know if you're walking through the fields and you can see weeds it's they're too big you almost have to get down on the ground and, and be looking for those two little leaves starting to come out um, and if you can do it during the heat of the day that's the best it'll you know as those weeds get pulled up they'll basically get burned off on the top I think is the idea um, and so crop competition is your best friend you know, don't do too much damage to the crop if you can help it. I know it's a fine line, but um, so this is what it looks like after, uh, right after harrowing, and here we are a week later. You can see it's starting to green up and actually doesn't look too bad. Um, <laughs> this is a bit of an experiment we did on the farm this year, and it's it's well, it's a little embarrassing maybe, but I'm going to share these pictures with you anyway. We wanted to see how far you could push the harrow before you'd actually damage the crop. So this is what it looks like out front, nice stand, pretty clean rows, and that's what it looked like behind when we were done. Um, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I lost some sleep that weekend after, <laughs> after we did that, but I wanted to know what happened. And so the idea was we are going to come back and take pictures throughout the season and then check the yield at the end and see how it did. Um, so yeah, so we heard it like this. This was a week later. So you can see it's actually started to come back. You can see most of the rows again. On the right is a, is a check strip that I left. You can see it's, it's definitely a little bit thicker. But um, I don't know, it, it doesn't seem to have set the crop back too much. But it did some. Um, and this is just watching how the plant reacted to this harrowing. Uh, it tended to, when we harrowed, we buried a lot of the leaves. But the plant tended to keep growing until it was able to pull its own leaves out from underneath the soil. 
Um, so it responded quite well, actually. Uh, this is a month later or so. Um, this is probably, I tried to find one of the worst spots in the field as far as, you know, so damage. you could see how much damage was done. And you can see there are still a few weeds that have come through in there. Um, but anywhere where it was thicker, if you'd walk five feet in either direction, there was almost nothing underneath. So in this case, it seemed to have worked. Um, here we are, just a side view. Looks pretty nice and thick. A lot better than when we had aired it out <laughs> back in the springtime. And this is, well, I couldn't actually find the check strip by the time I got to this stage. So it, it compensated really well and came back. Um, so I was quite happy about that. I, yeah, I lost quite a bit of sleep. <laughs> Uh, here we are uh, getting close to harvest and then a swath. We had a couple other fields just down the road that I hadn't been nearly as aggressive on and uh, the yields were basically the same. They were maybe a little bit lower, but, but pretty close. I was, I was actually surprised. Um, the Harrow is a versatile uh, piece of equipment on our farm. We use it in peas, we use it in beans, um, and basically anywhere else we can find to use it. Um, so that's the that's the two-minute version of this. Lovely. Any any so. questions for Jason on this? Yes. Okay. Starting here. <laughs> hey, whoa, <laughs> how did I start? Yeah. <laughs> Are you uh, harrowing and cultivating on something like navy beans or uh, the navy beans? We did. We tried both the harrowing and the cultivation uh, because beans you can't really you can't do a lot of hilling. You can't push a lot of dirt underneath them uh, to get rid of those weeds. So the harrowing was we experimented with that to try and take care of some of that. Nice. There were a couple more here. Questions? All right. Let's do it. So it is correct you are using your pine harrow even in your green manure years? Uh, we've done very little of that, but okay. we'll potentially be starting to do some of that. Um, just based on certain fields, uh, certain weeds, certain objectives that we, we want to try and, and, and accomplish, basically. But yeah, I think that will be something we'll be looking at for sure. Yep, the fellow behind oh. Stuart, yep. Okay. Is there any angle to the seed row that you harrow at that made a difference? Um, well, we found that if you harrow right along the row, uh, you're going to basically take everything out. Um, so it actually makes, when you get to the end, if you're harrowing at an angle, you get to the end and you do that, that loop around, um, you can wipe out a lot of that stuff. Or if you try and clean up that edge row, uh, you got to be really, you got to dial back that, the settings on the harrow quite a bit. Otherwise, you'll just you'll clean stuff out. So we we've been going at about a probably about a 15 degree angle to what uh, uh, you know what we see them basically. Um, and that seems to work fairly well for us. Okay, there was another hand over there. Oh, I had the same question. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then by accident, <laughs> <laughs> we had we had some we had some volunteers coming up in our our old crop, and I tried to harrow them out, and it didn't work. So, there, yeah, I know. So there's, so the there's potential for harrowing hemp. <laughs> Back there? Do you need the extra heavy to make up for the plants you plan on taking out? Yes, that is part of the strategy as well. Uh, we upped the seeding rates at the beginning, knowing that we're probably going to do some damage uh, mechanically when we weed. So that's part of the strategy for sure. Did you notice any disease differences in, like, in terms of mechanical damage and then disease differences at all? No, like. I, I don't think we ever actually cut the plant open during the harrow. We just more or less buried it. So as it pokes its way out, yeah, we didn't really notice any, any differences for sure. How quick would you harrow at? How fast? Yeah. Uh, that would have been, what, between four and five miles an hour. And it, it all depends on how much you can stomach when you look behind you. <laughs> well, I've had many guys put cardboard up so they wouldn't look, so they couldn't see, because they couldn't stand to look at it. But yeah. they knew because they'd seen that kind of thing. Yeah. They knew they had to do it, but they couldn't stand. So put cardboard up so you can't see. Awesome. But I know we, I've yeah. got other folks. So That's thanks good. so much, Jason. Right, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you are comfortable there or up, whichever you prefer. Uh, who would like to go next? I guess I can go first. Give her out. Okay. <laughs> uh, our experiences with Harris have been very similar to, to Jason's. So we use the nine box, so ours is very similar. One difference would be <clears throat> that uh, ours is on a three point, so we're able to lift it at the headlands. Um, that's beneficial. <clears throat> um, a lot of our experiences have been the same in, in terms of uh, how black the soil has been behind. There's, there's two uh, 
times of operation that we found the most beneficial ones that uh, uh, pre-emergent stage uh, going in and taking out anything that uh, might be coming up. Uh, sometimes you can't see them, but uh, like I say, they're, you know, they're there. Um, that's when you can utilize speed when you're going up to uh, nine, nine and a half, ten miles an hour. And with that Einbach arrow, the faster you're going, the more aggressive those those tines are. Uh, also vibrating sideways and on a one inch spacing that really covers the entire surface of the ground and uh, a lot of our operations throughout the year have been geared uh, also towards the maximizing uh, maximization of this harrow and so we're we're keeping our seating rates uh, higher I'm not I don't know if we'd say it's excessively high but maybe around that 10 percent higher uh, we, we also go off by the thousand kernel rate um, seed depth um, it's, making sure that the, our, most of our crops are cereals, that they've got a good anchor. Um, because if you want to, if you could throw that one picture up uh, for any Farms Herald, that would be great. Um, did one trial on some general purpose wheat and we went in at the one leaf stage, which is fairly young and it's a fairly small plant at, at that stage. And uh, noticing that we were pulling a few plants out uh, and pick up at the end of the row as you can see there's a couple of wheat plants and so I did leave a check uh, but just more so to to see what the yield would be and, and see if there was any damage to the wheat um, at harvest time really didn't see a decrease in yield at all but you can't tell how much uh, wheat uh, competition I eliminated there so. Um, so that would be more the second stage in that two to four leaf that was talked about earlier as being another benefit. Uh, same thing as in terms of speed, usually going around that four, four and a half miles an hour, but it really depends on, on how, how hard your soil is, how firm your soil is, how much that air is penetrating. Um, you know, again, how... Uh, Sorry, did you want the ones from your presentation you just showed? <coughs> or No, just really that one. Uh, the one the where arrow. the color yeah. is different? Not the fava beans. Yeah, yeah the other one. Just got so fava beans on my mind. <laughs> They're so beautiful. We all want fava beans that look like that. Hungry for liver. <laughs> but this one, where you can see half the, the yeah, yeah, just the one. Uh, hmm? Crane firms here. Yeah, is that why one oh, side of the song. picture is so much more because you yeah. harrowed one and didn't harrow the other? Yeah, the right side is the is the check where I didn't harrow. Nice. Oh. And and at harvest time, there really was no difference in yield, but obviously. A lot more seed banking. <laughs> Pause. So you weren't trying to grow canola in that one. We're trying to grow canola in that one. Nice. That's a nice example of what a difference it can make. And uh, along with um, like op other operations throughout the year, so along with um, seed rate and uh, and depth of seed, um, so or. Uh, Residue management is a big one too. Uh, with that harrow, you don't really want a whole lot of trash on the ground and, uh, and seed to prep. Uh, we harrow pack after our seeder, and so it creates a nice, even level uh, soil bed for, for that harrow to penetrate to pretty much 100%. Would, would duels of the tractor be better than singles for patches? Yeah. Does that have a bearing? Yeah, it's, it's sorry, we do run duels, but we try to. To minimize uh, compaction, for sure. You get a rain in there. Oh, oh wet. So yeah, moisture is definitely a factor in terms of arrow. Uh, you get it too wet, that will affect how firm your ground is. Uh, or if you get if you harrow and it's you know fairly black, and you get a, a heavy rain after that, it affects the ability for that plant to to come back out of the soil uh, to get its leaves back up and growing. But uh, generally. We found that the plants to stand back up, and carry on to some synergy or experiences there's more work. Nice and loud so the people in the back can hear you too. I said that does the will the harrow work in wet conditions or does that be fairly dry? You probably want it more on the drier side. Because uh, you can you can have a tendency for those times to ball up and then it's it's scratching more, you know, it's it's dragging heavier. So probably more on the drier side, maybe more preferable. It is a small window of opportunity to, to maximize the effectiveness, but 
we've gone in in various conditions and, and found some benefit to a hero. Some are better than others, but I guess in terms of their effect. So if you do get a raid and you, and you can't get in there, how late can you go with the arrow once it dries up? We've gone past four-leaf stage. Um, it all depends on the weeds that you're, you're going after. Uh, sometimes then you're not pulling them out, but you're setting them back, you're allowing the crop to, to kind of be over. Um, the different conditions do, do dictate different results, but uh, like we've gone in, we went into some oats, uh, we did a trial in some oats uh, when the oats was more than, more than four or five leaf, and it was, it was getting quite lush already. <clears throat> but even though it wasn't uprooting any mustard plants per se, it was knocking it back and, and for it to be Talk a little bit about speed, but uh, are you guys use about the same kind of aggressiveness on that uh, your arrow with high angle? Yeah, it's the arrow itself isn't very aggressive. You use the speed for the aggression, and and that depends on which operation you're doing. Like uh, pre-emergence, there you want to be as aggressive as you can, and and then depending on you know if you want to go into that one to two leaf stage, obviously you want to go slower, and. If you've got a good route on it, the, the three to four, you can afford some more speed. So you're not, changing, you're not ever changing that the angle, like maybe right? Not really. No, I'm. I've got it set so that like it's uniform front to back, and uh, just mostly using speed to, for that aggression. Oh, one more, and then we got to go move on to Al. So. Uh, wood crop. <laughs> Well, that was uh, that's a general purpose wheat, so it's uh, generally not like a general on the higher side. Like we, were, I was said before, like maybe that was roughly two bushels, maybe a little more. Yeah. What do you think percentage wise? It's very low. Um, it was less than five percent. And some operators have told me they feel that the percentage of plant destroyed is countered by the tillering effect on the stressed plants that that survive and actually produce more because of that. It's like you've all heard of post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, there's post-traumatic stress benefits where you learn from the trauma that you experienced and you're even and you produce more. And that's what I think can happen if you have the right technique. But on that little diatribe, Al, do you want to? Take your turn. Mine isn't near as sexy as any of that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet you Don loves being called sexy. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I'm kind of addicted to a baler still on that, so I've tried uh, minimizing any, once I'm done seeding, I'm kind of a poor farmer that way that I walk away from it and then move on to the next job. So we do very little in row or in field heroin after it's seeded. Um, I have tried it in Crossart, came over last year and we did some weeding. We, we did see some results with the mustard there, but I think we're almost a little bit too late with it. I'd like to try some of the blind hair over there and that, but we're mostly shooting for uh, crop varieties, picking our, you know, maybe growing oats on a field that's less competitive, or bigger weed issues. I really love my winter wheats, my fall rise, that sort of stuff, growing crops that are very competitive and uh, allowing to get the jump and then like I said, same thing back to clovers. Uh, hairy vetch is a great one. We try to throw that in a lot of different different uh, crops or so in the spring too, just to give us something else growing underneath there. And then um, peas and mustard kind of intercropping a lot of different things too, where we can always have something else growing with the crop, just trying to basically smother them out more and, and try to put enough, um, I guess you'd say, tame species in there that we want to see that we don't have to worry too much about uh, weed pressure that way. We have done little bit of clipping once in a while too but that's kind of the last resort uh, things gotta get pretty bad before it gets to that stage um, yeah other than that, like I said just kind of working on our plow down here trying to do a good job of, of uh, taking care of some of maybe those problem weeds that we have on that year so maybe we can focus on the next two years not having a weed issue so much I mean sometimes things are out of your hands uh, livestock we have done a bit of clipping too where sometimes you can uh, 
know, go in and swath some of those bad patches in a field and utilize that, bale them up and pull them off or whatever. Um, the farm I'm on now, they had a really bad wild oat resistant problem there. And so for the first three years, there's a 200 acre field that basically would be, I bet you 40% wild oats. So one year there, we didn't even seed it and we ended up pulling off about three and a half round bales the acre of straight <laughs> wild oats. But you know, there's not even a wild oat left on that field now after after uh, two years of basically a, a hay and regiment there. And so it actually really took care of it well. And, and I guess delayed seeding's the other one kind of same thing was what Don was talking about earlier with the plowed elms. You know, we're always mixing things up. We try to get some weeds in early one year, and the next year we might not sow that field till 10th of June. And uh, like I say, between our winter crops and then perennial crops, like I said, alfalfas, I'm not a big fan on the nutrient removal, but if you can leave the nutrients there for, I found two years wasn't quite enough. So I think we're gonna go back to three years of alfalfa. Um, the thistles still seem to be there in year two where it seems if we left it for that third, third year we could take care of that thistle problem too once we came back out of it it was it was a nice clean field again um my brother he bought some land from uh, some people that were organic there and i guess it, lots of wild mustard pressure and it was very disappointing because it had been hay for six years and this year he had a beautiful flax field about a month into it it did it came back wild mustard so i don't think with the hay in the rotation you're never going to beat that one the mustard's one of those things that's there forever and it's not one of those things that's either <coughs> there or not. So that's that's kind of what we do in our operation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so let's, yeah, let's have some questions. Nice and either use the mic or speak so that everyone can hear, okay? Yeah, as far as mustard, we have the, I did spells this year. Uh, so I was earlier, I didn't quite visit. Um, I've seen it quite high rates, but I wanted to do a lot of harrowing and so aggression works for you. Well, <laughs> I'm really, you have to be careful. You really got to use a lot of common sense. All I, I think the big thing to do is before you pull that hair out, there's a book that field use my hand, just get up there and pretend your hair with your fingers and see what it's doing in those plants. Or something, you know, mimic that before you even walk out there on the track. So that's the best thing to do. My, my ground was really compact. Well, it was actually compact. We had um, like a foot of snow right the, that night that I seen that field. Those two fields I had. And that soil, this heavy clay loam, it just crusted hard on there. And that felt the struggle to get out of there. There was a lot of issues. And the weeds, that was actually 2013 fall. I broke that, worked three times in the detail right before the snow flew. Couldn't get onto it, it was too wet. So I summer fall in 14, or yeah, 14 of this past year, I put the spelt in. I could take my finger and probably 78% of the field and pull it down with okay, the weed and stuff that. Lady something must have was the worst. That, that heroin was marvelous. I, I was hard to see it. It was quite clean, but I see a little more weed issues. Uh, but again, so. Well, thank you for sharing your experience. Other questions? I got one. Yeah, go ahead. You guys, you probably ran a Herman Harrow before you did the iBlock or something like that, like a four or five bar, did you at one time? Yeah. Like Into the mic so the crowd can hear you. <laughs> well, I was just asking if uh, when they were before an iBlock or whatever with these nice European heroes, what they found the difference was, was it worth the money spent when you upgraded to uh, one inch spacing, high speed harrow? We have a, a Western harrow and uh, it gets a lot more aggressive of a harrow and it also didn't have the uh, that spacing that yeah. the Einbach does. And so I would definitely recommend the, the an Einbach over that type of harrow. It was def it was still effective. Uh, it still did a job. You'd, still, you'd have to be more uh, conscious of the timing of, of uh, going into the crop with a more aggressive harrow like that. Not to say that it wouldn't do some good, but uh, found that uh, the Einbach style uh, was more, it had more of a uh, solid uh, effect over the ground. 
Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. You were talking about burying some of the plants and they were able to come back. Have you ever found that or have had any experience with corn, like burying corn and how, how uh, much of a regrowth, how much, how much strength is in the corn plants compared to the cereals as far as coming out of the buried situation? Right. Uh, so the question was whether we've had any experience uh, with harrowing corn or burying corn, whether it will come back. Uh, no, I haven't actually done a lot of, I've actually never harrowed corn before. We've done row crop, uh, like inter-row cultivation with corn, but just just thinking about it, I mean, it's uh, at that stage when it's really small, it's still fairly flexible. Um, so whether it would pull through like the grain does, I, I'm not sure. I, you know, I've, n I've been on thousands of farms. I've done probably 3,500 inspections. I've never heard of anybody that harrowed corn. Mm -hmm. I've always seen row crop. So that there's probably a reason for that. If you want to experiment. <laughs> but if you say, if you row crop cultivate, like how can you bury? Uh, your your oh, corn. Oh, that way. You're trying to get you know the stems. And how how uh, right? How much uh, a rebound are you going to get out of corn compared to cereals? Right. Well, typically, like if we're trying to hill that that corn or that hemp, we're waiting until it's about that tall, and then you go through it, throw that dirt up against the base. Uh, we, you know, if it's short, if it's small like that, then we only go, you know, we're going slower. We get the shields down, and usually the dirt doesn't quite get all the way up to the to the plant itself. So. We, we try not to bury it if possible. I'm kind of new at this. I've done it for a couple of years. I'm still looking for the, the okay. right answer. <laughs> or the right way, I guess. Yeah. Well, we're all looking for the right answers. That's why we're here. Another question at the back. I'm just wondering how deep you go with the eye box. Depth? The question about depth? <laughs> okay. Um, how deep? It's hard to say because it depends on how fast you go with the tractor. Like the faster you go, the more it's going to ride up and, and vibrate. But I mean, it doesn't seem to disturb seed that's deeper than an inch. Um, so when we're going through the field, like it's it's probably disturbing the top half to three quarters of an inch, maybe. Uh, and you know, it's hard to say because it all depends on what kind of soil you're in, how wet it is. Uh, there's so many things. But uh, yeah, I, that, maybe that's that's close for you. Three quarters of an inch, maybe. I don't know. Is that close? Or? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, it does yeah. depend on your soil conditions. I've had it uh, penetrate up to an inch and a half. But that's a very mellow soil, so seed depth is like we're we try to stay aware of that. And but yeah, I, I would agree. With you. Okay, here, Scott. Oh, we can't do that you showed us earlier, I guess, grazing some of your cover crop, and if you felt you were having a weed problem in it, I know you don't like going around and around, but would you ever swap graze rather than graze them so you kind of get the timing right now, or do you tend to want to just um, stomp it in? And I would rather stomp it in, but I definitely am open to that one, Scott. I think that is definitely a, a good plan B to have kind of in your back pocket there, and give you another option there. So no, I, I do like that one. And the problem we do have even mob grazing, thistles are a tough one. Um, I've actually gone back and clipped them after we've left the field just to kind of nip them. And see them after that, you kind of hit them at the end of July there and just after kind of, the, the yearlings will pick the flowers off the top or whatever, but that's kind of about it. So um, very hard to get them to knock that one down. So I, I don't think that would be a bad fit like you say to maybe spot <laughs> spot pick your um or le leave a spot like that and, and cut her out okay any final one more here one more here yeah for your winter wheat growers i know the conventional farmers always want to grow their winter wheat in canola stubble what uh, what have you folks used for as far as the previous crop and going into winter wheat seeding uh, for us, for winter wheat production, we've traditionally always been on a summer for like plow down scenario. So we're sowing the end of August or whatever. But what we're starting to do now, we're growing yellow mustard the first year after a plow down. And then I'm actually going in to the mustard stubble. Well, actually, I wasn't planning, but we had too much volunteer alfalfa on the fields this year. We actually end up disking it once first and then so we winter weed into that. So that's kind of where I'm leaning at more. If we have a field with enough nutrients where I want to go a yellow mustard and just drill straight into that. And then 
we were out in Saskatchewan and a month ago at a meeting and the guy, he's sewing um, Indian head black lentils and he sews them about the 10th of July and then the middle of August he goes in with his winter wheat drill straight into those Indian head lentils and they'll grow to about minus eight or 10 before they freeze off. So he's got about a 10 inch mulch and I guess they're pretty stiff by that stage and they'll do a really good job of shading that winter wheat and acting as a snow trap. So that's that's this year's experiment for me is to get my hands on some of them. So yeah, we're usually, usually we are just sowing them on black dirt. We also have brought in some winter wheat seed this year from Alberta that's supposed to be damn near as hardy as winter, or sorry, as fall rye. So we will find out this year if the guy was full of BS or not. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Okay, well, please join me in thanking these gentlemen and all the volunteers.